one of the things that's so striking about shamanism in the in the uh, native context is the absence of mental illness, the absence of uh, serious neurotic patterns of behavior. This is because this uh, translinguistic reality is allowed to work its will through shamanism, is allowed to regulate the society. In other words, our model of how society works is we are at war with nature and we must push it back, seize a beachhead, fortify our position, dig in these kinds of metaphors, metaphors of capture and control, while the shamanic approach is we must communicate with nature in order that nature can communicate with us in order that we may know what should be done. And shamanism as classically practiced is hunting magic, weather magic, healing magic. In other words, ways of getting into the evolving of state-bound system patterns within nature. Weather, we would presume, can to some degree be, produ be predicted by looking at past weather states. Hunting can to some degree be predicted by looking at the migration and movement of game in past situations. So uh, shamanism then becomes a kind of mnemonic exercise where by keeping track of what has happened, you can build up a model of what will happen. And originally this was done through great mnemonic feats of memory you know, like the Yugoslavian folktale singers or the Homeric epics or the people who sang the Edda. These were, uh, you know, works of hundreds of thousands of lines that were passed down virtually without change over millennia. But in, there's a strange phenomenon in, at least in the evolution of cultures, and perhaps more generally, which is every step into freedom contains within it the potential for greater bondage. Now what I mean by that is, here's an example of it, women uh, in charge of the gathering phase in hunting gathering cultures developed language, I believe, because they had great need of the ability to make fine distinctions. In other words, here you have 50 grasses, uh, small herbs, shrubs. There are, they have roots, fruits, berries, seeds, inflorescences. Some of these things are poisonous. Some of these things are foods. Some grow in the spring, some in the fall, some along the river courses, some on the hilltops, so forth and so on. A, a great many descriptive dimensions come to bear on this. So consequently, I think women are to be uh, held responsible for the evolution of language in order to discuss the extremely important matter of what is good to eat and what is not and where do you find it and how do you preserve it and what do you combine it with and so forth and so on. Men, on the other hand, who were in charge of the hunting because of the different body type and bladder capacity and so on, uh, the premium there was placed on silence, stoicism, being able to stalk and for days make no noise possibly and to just, you know, sort of integrate into this silent uh, kind of thing. Well, this same kind of uh, freedom which binds occurred in the shamanic uh, effort to steer culture by mnemonic means because 
eventually even the greatest of of the shamanic memory uh, artists were overwhelmed by the amount of data, by the size of the epics, by the sheer length of these genealogies. So then symbolic notation is brought in and, and shamanism turns into scribecraft and signifying magical forces turns into writing down their names and there is a tremendous binding a compression, a, a limitation of freedom because the strategy of freedom became uh, too successful. So this, this reaching beyond ourselves is a process that is continuous. We transcend a state, we then lock ourselves into the uh, transcendent mm -hmm. state, it becomes defined by its own set of limitations and we move beyond it. And this kind of, of uh, bootstrapping mechanism, I think, has been at work throughout the evolution of language, throughout the evolution of shamanism. Now we have come to a similar kind of bind having to do with the bankruptcy of uh, analytical analysis and rationalism which has led us to a, a pretty complete mastery of inert matter. But when pushed into the quantum realm, suddenly contradictions begin to multiply and impossible conclusions force themselves upon the investigator. Well, what this means is that rationalism has simply reached its limit. There is nothing, no reason to think that it doesn't have a limit. It was just the inflated fantasy of the 17th century that thought that God's mind must work like the mind of a watchmaker. But in fact, uh, what with chaos theory and catastrophism and uh, numerous other um, non-equilibrium partial differential processes in nature, we now know that nature is extremely unpredictable, highly variable, not subject to uh, analytical understanding except in very limited domains. What this understanding that quantum physics has brought the physicists and that the psychedelic state has brought uh, the people who pursue that, it has not fed back into the mainstream of society. We're still living in a male-dominated, object-dominated, subject-other kind of uh, uh, world model, a world model inherited from the 18th century uh, really even more than from the 19th century. Well, is it going to kill us? Is it too late? Uh, what can we do about it? This is what I talked about last night, about, uh, about the archaic revival as the notion of uh, making a sharp left turn away from the momentum that the historical vehicle wants to follow, which is phanatoptic. Don't kid yourself. I mean, you cannot have three religions stacked up on top of each other, stretching back 4,000 years, pursuing this monotheistic vision, which ends in an apocalypse, without building a tremendous morphogenetic predilection for the apocalypse and our demonic investigations into matter have led us to create the machinery to produce the apocalypse. It's interesting, somebody said of, uh, of the Reagan administration, uh, this was when James Watt was running around saying we didn't have to save the trees because Jesus was coming anyway, so it didn't matter. And uh, someone said, uh, 
the jerks want to be in the Bible. And that's precisely the historical situation. The jerks want to be in the Bible. In other words, every petty potentate from Frederick Barbarossa to Ronald Reagan has secretly believed that they were uh, living in the time of the Antichrist and uh, would participate in the scenario of the book of Revelations. I mean, this is psychosis if you meet it in a person. If you meet it in a culture, it's called religious piety and conviction. Uh, and it has been going on so long that it has actually created a very narrow neck in the historical process that cannot be avoided. We now have no choice in the matter of business as usual. There will not apparently be business as usual. There will either be an apocalyptic destruction of the planet, a kind of Ragnarok, a Gotterdammerung, a complete storm of fire brought on by the eruption of the psychotic mythologies that have driven the matter-centered uh, monotheistic male ego culture. Or there will be a, uh, a plucking of victory from the jaws of that defeat and not an apocalypse, but a kind of cultural millennium, a complete breaking out of the pattern into something else. And some of you may know um, Rian Eisler's work, The Chalice and the Blade. If you haven't read this book, I recommend it to you for psychedelic people, for feminists, for people concerned with the state of society. This is certainly an important book. And what she's saying is partnership. It is not true that the story of the human race is the story of a pendulum swing between matriarchy and patriarchy, each with its own flaws. It, rather, it is that human beings have always lived in an e equilibrium-style partnership society, except during the last 8,000 years, this pattern has been disrupted by the rise of the male ego, the suppression of the logos-like connection to nature, and uh, uh, a certain evolutionary path taken in the epigenetic coding of information. In other words, the phonetic alphabet. The phonetic alphabet, which has no reference to the icon of the things expressed, is utterly cool, utterly unable then to give you any feeling of engagement which, with what is being described. This gives permission for analytical science and the detachment of rationalism and uh, the sorts of philosophies that have created the tremendous split between head and heart that characterizes the political systems of, of, uh, of the last several hundred years. Well, this thing which the shamans are contacting, which we can call another dimension, hyperspace, the collective unconscious, Whatever it is, it is the ground of our becoming. And the only way to, to sort of unhitch ourselves from the ego is to open pathways of communication to this invisible field of intentionality in which we are embedded. And this is a very difficult task because the culture in which we live denies that this thing even exists. I mean, if you start saying that you feel the heartbeat of the planet or that you are in resonance with the local ecosystem or still worse, if you say that you hear the voices of elves and fairies, uh, this is psychopathy automatically. You know, you have to be observed, sedated, 
and cured because uh, you, you're participating in a model of reality that is not consensually validated. Nevertheless, I think what we're trying to do with meetings like this is empower this particular meme, empower this idea. Uh, I can't remember who developed the idea of memes, but it's basically the notion that ideas compete with each other the way animals and plants compete in an ecosystem, that ideas uh, adapt and spread and occupy niches and defend territory and redefine environments. And so my mentioning last night of the woman who said to me, I thought I was crazy until I heard you speak. For me, that is really the nugget of this work and the most satisfying kind of comment that anybody could make because uh, what has happened since the 1960s is the straight people all went off together. And by this I don't refer to sexual preference. I use straight in the earlier sense. The straight people all went off and became very weird together. <laughs> you know, with their golden Mercedes and their Picasso ceramics and all that. Uh, the freaks all went off and became strange alone, each apart in our own way because community was shattered, affinity groups were suppressed, people went all kinds of directions. Now, uh, the people who went through the 60s, uh, approaching or in their 40s, have had 20 years to see how they like that kind of... Uh, alienated aloneness and so this morning as we went around I heard many people saying uh, uh, you know that they had done these things in the 60s but not for a long time and now they were returning to it I think this is because it finally dawns on you that you know this may be the only shot you've got at it I mean reincarnation is fine past <laughs> lives are fine but we're all getting daily older and uh, we don't know where we came from, you know, what lies beyond the zygote. And we don't know where we're going, what lies beyond the pine box. Who can say? So out of the incredible mystery of whatever the universe is, a microsecond of opportunity against impossible odds has sprung into being. We are embedded in that moment of opportunity. So what are you going to do with it? Are you going to sweep up around the ashram for 30 years and then <laughs> decide that that was a mistake? Or, you know, are you going to just give yourself over to the arms of Holy Mother Church uh, for a lifetime? I mean, people do this. You cannot escape making some kind of commitment to something. Nobody gets through life without uh, being asked to, uh, to sign up either in their own club or somebody else's. The mushroom said to me once uh, in the way that it does when it delivers these aphorisms, it said, uh, you must have a plan if you have no plan, you will become part of somebody else's plan. You either have a plan or you are part of somebody else's plan. And so I think, uh, I think people are waking up to the fact that uh, we must use what works. Because you see, uh, someone on this side of the room, when we went around, talked about yoga and how the, you know, the psychedelic gives the experience on demand, and but are we ready, and how do you gain skills, and this sort of thing. To my mind, the goal is not the psychedelic experience. The beginning of the path is the psychedelic experience. So if yoga promises that after 20 years, 
it will deliver you to the beginning of the path, <laughs> then you know there's something seriously wrong here. Uh, the, the psychedelic sets you at the beginning of the path. And then people do all kinds of things with it. I mean, I am amazed. I feel there is more variation in how we deal with this than in almost any other phase of human activity because some people seem to have almost no self-reflection. And I've noticed it also touches sexuality because I don't know how many of you have ever encountered the play, uh, the penthouse forum, but this is where people write into penthouse and, and detail these astonishing sexual, unpredictable sexual exploits, threesomes, foursomes, and twelvesomes that just fell upon them. And whenever I have, for some reason, some occasion to read these things, <laughs> what is amazing to me is that this appears to be uh, descriptions of the behavior of an alien species <laughs> because there is no self-reflection on what does this mean? You know, what does this mean that I get stuck in an elevator and end up copulating with 12 stockbrokers? <laughs> it's just... It's just, uh, it's just accepted as uh, how it is. Well, you get this same thing with psychedelics where you say to someone and they say, oh yeah, in the, ni in the 60s I took psychedelics. You know, wow, it was really strange. All these colors and, and voices and, uh, and apparently no self-reflection. No realization that this is actually happening to you. This is happening to you. Therefore, the implications must be fairly central. And then other people immediately get it. They say, you know, my gosh, this plant, this pill shows me that reality is at least a thousand times larger than I thought it was. Showed me that I don't know who I am, where I am, what I am, or anything else. Uh, and I don't know what it takes to, uh, to instill that in people. Maybe intellectual self-reflection. One of the things that is so puzzling about uh, shamans when you actually deal with them in the field is they are not like the other people in the tribe. The other people in the tribe are very tribal people. In other words, they have all the curious cultural limitations of people in every culture. They think you smell funny, they think you look funny, everything you do is amusing, uh, they stand around in small groups giggling and pointing and uh, like that. The shamans, on the other hand, it's nothing like that. They accept you totally as a person. They make no cultural judgments. You don't look funny, smell funny, uh, so forth and so on, because they are what I call extra, environmental, extra environmentals. They are deconditioned from the assumptions of their own culture. So they may be the Witoto shaman, but the Witoto shaman is less Witoto than any other Witoto because the Witoto shaman operates in the context of witoto embedded in the larger reality. And so I think what we need to do when we try to revivify shamanism in our own lives is recover uh, the profound <coughs> reality of what it's doing. Sometimes I have flashes when I'm giving these talks of how different it is to be stoned than to talk about being stoned. I mean, here we sit, you know, in our cotton underwear, <laughs> just uh, with our where we came from, our schedules in front of us, uh, the mundaneness of it is so all-pervasive. 
And we could be dis discussing Gnosticism or a political action project, or, but we're discussing instead something really appalling, I think. I mean, we're calmly discussing the fact that there is another world overlapping our own and uh, very few people will even admit the fact. So I always think, and, and this is my symbol of myself, to myself, I always think of a wonderful B science fiction movie I saw when I was a kid where uh, there's a dinosaur in the swamp and uh, it's set somewhere in Mexico and uh, the typical campesino is sent by the patron of the ranch uh, to gather firewood in the jungle. And he, of course, encounters this extremely large rubber reptile roaring around and then comes back to the ranch and is pointing back in the woods and is completely inarticulate trying to say, you know, a, a creature from the id, a beast, from another dimension is rampaging around in the forest. Well, they just dismiss him as, you know, these peasants, they believe anything, you can't trust them for a moment. This is the sort of uh, situation we're in. Uh, the extraterrestrial invasion that so many uh, people anticipate or the extraterrestrial contact that so many people uh, hope for and that sells so many cheap newspapers is well underway. It's simply that the words we have to describe it are utterly inadequate. So words like extraterrestrial invasion, contact with an intelligent species, end of history, migration into hyperspace, these are pathetic signifiers of what is actually happening to us. What is actually happening to us is uh, pretty darn hard to wrap your mind around. We are caught in a vortex of concrescence and compression that was set in motion at least as early as the melting of the last glaciation. We are reaping the fruits of 10,000, 50,000 years of sowing of the fields of mind and it is being dropped into our laps for us to create, uh, you know, human machine interfacing, uh, control of genetic material, redefinition of uh, social reality, re-engineering of languages, uh, revisioning of the planetary ecology, all these things fall upon us and for us to be worthy of it, for us to make sense of it, for us to be anything other than victimized by the 20th century, we need, I think, to reach back into time and to uh, anchor ourselves with the transcendent mystery which is uh, somehow tied up with our own being, somehow present on the planet, but mostly a large list of unanswered questions. We don't know what is going on on this planet. We don't know why there is life here, whether it's an accident, somebody's plan. Uh, we don't know why intelligence is here. Again, accident, plan, if plan, whose plan, if plan, for what, uh, if plan, where are we in the plan? I mean, we all uh, tend, when we abandon ourselves to cultural values, to focus in so tightly that we lose the big picture. And if psychedelics are anything, they are a zoom lands back to the broadest possible uh, point of view. Well, why don't we stop there uh, and take a, just a 10 minute break or something and then we'll come back and do dialogue on this. <coughs> so uh, why don't we use the rest of this morning to see if we're getting oriented right and to 
just discuss any questions you have or anything that comes up for you out of this so far. Does anybody have anything? Yeah. Um, I was curious about uh, what you were talking about with extraterrestrials and not having the appropriate language to really discuss it and like your view of what's going on and can you put it in words so that we can <laughs> well um, it's, it changes for me all the time I mean I'm not I don't have a point of view and my primary job is not public speaking or writing but exploring when I first started taking mushrooms in and Throughout the 70s, when we wrote the Mushroom Grower's Guide, my st I held several opinions, but my most strongly held opinion was it actually is an extraterrestrial. Just no shit, flat out, it is an extraterrestrial. And what's surprising to me is that uh, a single mushroom trip uh, of a certain sort could probably put me right back there again. Uh, getting it worked down to Gaia or the overmind of the species is a kind of process of coming down from the real un, uh, uh, assimilatable context of the, of, uh, the experience. It's like an extraterrestrial. It's, I mean, I would certainly say this. You know, if extraterrestrials appeared over Washington and Moscow tomorrow, it wouldn't make this any less mysterious or puzzling. Uh, in fact, uh, the extraterrestrials might turn out to be mundane. This is not. Uh, how it speaks, this is the most astonishing thing for me to get used to. I mean, the visual hallucination, somehow I can work it around that these are floods of imagery set off from deep structures of the brain and dumping of memory banks, and, but that it can just address you in real time and say, Terrence, <laughs> you know, and then proceed to blow my mind. The only, and now several things may be happening here, uh, the only time when we have the experience of focusing on an incoming message, decoding it in real time, and responding to it immediately, is when we have a conversation with someone. So if you find yourself responding to a message in real time, uh, your brain automatically thinks you're having a conversation. Saying, you know, if it looks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, it must be a duck. So here I am listening and responding to someone speaking to me in English. Therefore, this must be a conversation. Uh, there are physical arguments for viewing the mushroom as extraterrestrial. First of all, what is psilocybin? Psilocybin is 4-phosphoroxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine. Of all the indole compounds in nature, of all the indole compounds in nature, only psilocybin is uh, uh, hydroxylated at the 4 position. Well, now, if you were to design a computer program to search Earth, to search the life forms of Earth for evidence of extraterrestrial origin, one of the things you would tell this program to do is look for unusual molecules that have no apparent cousins or relatives among other organisms. Well, here is psilocybin, phosphorylated in the four position. Nothing else on earth is. A, a, a material argument for its origin outside of the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, a slightly different argument 
that would see the mushroom as extraterrestrial is uh, look at its uh, style, for want of a better word. I mean, what is a mushroom? First of all, they reproduce by spores. Spores are the most economical biological unit imaginable. They can survive the uh, radiation levels of interstellar space. They can survive for eons under conditions very close to those encountered in deep space. Uh, the mushroom spore falls into an ecosystem, <clears throat> it immediately undergoes uh, uh, cell division, a fine thread-like network full of neurotransmitters begins to spread itself through the soil. It's a very closely analogous to the neural network of a higher animal, including a human being. Now, we're accustomed to thinking that an extraterrestrial would bear the imprint of the evolutionary situation in which it came to be. In other words, if it was if it evolved on a low gravity planet, it will be tall and thin. If it evolved in a methane atmosphere, it will have an exotic body chemistry and so forth. But that's because we ourselves have possessed the knowledge of how DNA works for only about 40 years. It's reasonable to assume, I think, that if an intelligent species gets a thousand years of study of DNA, that they can design themselves to be however they care to be. And in fact, if you think of the mushroom from that point of view, I think that we might choose that kind of an adaptation if we could have any form we wanted because it's very non-invasive very humbly insinuates itself into a situation and grows essentially on waste material in the soil. Yet when it sporulates, it can actually cross uh, spatial, the boundary of outer space. And, uh, you know, great economy, great artistry, tremendous zen-like aesthetics seem expressed in the mushroom if you view it as a designed piece of work rather than an object in the environment. And then finally, of course, the, the major argument for the extraterrestrial origin of the mushroom, but it's an insider argument, is the content of the experience. Number one, it says it's an extraterrestrial organism and it has the data to back up the claim. It can show you movies of desert worlds, jungle worlds, high-pressure, high-gravity methane worlds, worlds, uh, planets whose cores are helium-4, and uh, worlds un where you don't know whether you're inside an organism or inside some kind of piece of machinery, whether you're under the surface of a planet. I mean, th literally things that our minds just stop in the presence of. So to me, that's really the interesting thing about the mushroom is that it can be as friendly as it needs to be and can even reassure you with a Disney-esque uh, burlesque of dancing flowers and uh, pirouetting pink elephants. But once you are comfortable with it and enter the dialogue and begin to get to know it, getting to know it is an appalling experience because you can say to it, show me a little more of who you are for yourself. And then, you know, a veil is lifted and your jaw just drops. And then you say, show me a little more of who you are. And that's enough of who you are for yourself. Because, and you wonder, you know, while this thing is talking to me, is it talking, is how engaged is the mushroom by me? 
Is, it, is all of its attention focused upon me when I'm talking to it the way all of my attention is focused back on it? Or is it like a multi-user computer system? Is it able to simultaneously deal with huge numbers of organisms? What is the relationship of psilocybin to the inner life of the mushroom? Is it stoned all the time? Why does it want... Why is it so important that these indole compounds get lodged in the nervous system of mammals? It's almost as though it's a symbiotic relationship that the mushroom does not truly live its life unless it is taken, unless its molecular, uh, its unique molecular component can find its way into the synapses of a self-reflecting higher animal. Well, then, what is it? What are we for? For it? And you know, you can ask these questions. Well, I think that it's for service. Like they don't, in, you know, they don't impose themselves. You have to. Yes, they usually, uh, one reason I think people have had trouble confirming the animate and intelligent quality of the mushroom is you must ask. You know, you just don't take psilocybin and sit there because it won't do it. But if you take psilocybin and call it in, in some sense, whatever that means, invoke, call, uh, uh, try to uh, visualize, then it will begin to come towards you and lift these veils and this world of zany, pun-like, hyperdimensional intelligence that is revealed is as strange as an extraterrestrial would be. This is, I guess, the final content of evidence <coughs> for the extraterrestrial origin is the fact that it just seems so different from anything one could conceive of or imagine. I mean, you cannot, in one of these volleys of hallucination, convince yourself, this is only me. These are my memories, or these are distorted transforms of past experience. Or, because, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was trained as an art historian to have an eye for stylistic difference and cohesion of, uh, of uh, a set of aesthetic canons and it just blows my mind. I mean, there is more art locked up in these things to be viewed in a single hour than the human race has produced in 10,000 years. I mean, and art of a compelling, weird, breathtaking, awesome quality that just breathes in every pore of itself, you know, this is the other, this is not you, don't be deceived, my little primate friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It seems like our popular culture has had inklings of that, because if you look at the movies that came out, you know, between 1952 and 1962, so many of the sci-fi movies are about spores from outer space and plants coming down, and these are from very straight people who hadn't taken, you know, psychedelics at all. They're like tuning, maybe they're you know, tuning into what was about to come 10 or 15 years later. Well, I think, uh, and I'm, so far as I know, pretty alone in this opinion, that uh, information actually, a very small percentage of information is able to tunnel backward through time. That there is a very small counterflow to the forward movement of causal efficacy. And one of the things that shamanism is about is going into that hyperdimensional place and picking up this thin, thin signal from the future and tuning it in. This is why prophecy and seership and all of that has to do with states of ecstasy and intoxication. Uh, one way of viewing uh, all religion and all uh, spiritual metaphor making is as an anticipation of the future. These Western religions have this apocalyptic transformation built into them almost as a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
In other words, they believe the world is going to end because the world is going to end. And since the melting of the glaciers, people of sufficient sensitivity have heard through a vast wall of stochastic noise coming from the future, the thin, reedy broadcast station of uh, the true vision of the future. And this seems to be one of the things that you can do with these psychedelics is tune this in. You know, it's a cliche, and I'm sure you've heard it, that artists are society's antenna for change, that artists are supposed to be somehow uh, m more sensitive than the rest of us, and, and they pick up the new design forms, the evolving aesthetic canons, and then translate it into society for the rest of us. Well, that gains a little more bite if you substitute shaman for artist and realize that this may not be a metaphor. It may not be simply because they pursue bohemian lifestyles and are willing to accept poverty for a life of free thinking and so forth. That isn't what's allowing an anticipation of the future. What's happening is there truly is an anticipation of the future. And uh, uh, visionaries like William Blake or, or the author of Revelations are actually people who, by virtue of some fortuitous confluence of circumstance, space, time, and uh, genetic constitution, are able to draw these messages out. What is startling is that apparently this is fairly ordinary in psychedelic states. That in fact, uh, one way of thinking of psychedelics is uh, you begin to move through time when you put them into your life. I don't mean while the trip is happening. I mean ever after. I mean, if you're living with a 1960s-style mind and you have a strong psychedelic experience, you will come down with a 1970s mind or perhaps a 2040-style mind. Mind is a temporal style. It's like